Okay. All right, everyone, welcome to Six Scale, um, August 5th. Uh, the link to the docs in chat. Um, everyone can please add themselves as an attendee. All right, so we've got a bunch of agenda items to go over. Um, and um, before we do, how was uh, last week? It seems like we had a bunch of things that were discussed. Um, looks like um, things progressed pretty well. Like any leftover items for this week? Uh, I'm assuming people added them or brought them up. Or is there anything we want to discuss from last week? No, okay. All right, well, we'll just keep going on then with today's agenda. Okay, um, and thanks David for hosting it. I really appreciate it. Okay, first item, uh, discuss how to handle mem CPU requests on pods, uh, different scale requirements. Uh, return scale requires different resource requests to control plane components. Great. So this is something that actually uh, Ramon pointed uh, last time actually to discuss uh, this uh, meeting. So it's coming from last meeting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, um, I was like trying to see like the, the metrics, uh, what's what they have in the covert. And I saw some, uh, you know, alerts uh, in the vertuperator. And uh, one of the alerts, it's related to um, their requests, CPU and the usage. And, and then uh, I tried to verify that in, in the scaling, well, the small scaling experiment that we have. And, uh, and then actually we can see, you know, the special for memory is fine. What's negative here, it means that the request it's smaller than the usage. So, and uh, yeah. And uh, it's, although it looks like small, but it's significant for CPU requests and this shouldn't be like that. So we, we need to, of course, we need to do some more tests to define what should be at least a desirable uh, CPU request. It can be like too big, but it also shouldn't be too small in the way that I think is do it's happening now. And uh, uh, Roman mentioned something last meeting. I don't remember now what he mentioned, but one thing that impacts that it's for sure this scheduling, um, you know, and also if it's requesting less things and we are placing that with the, you know, the, the scheduling and should be putting more interference in the workloads and so on. So, and uh, again, so I don't remember now other thing that Roman mentioned. So I think he's not today, right? But, okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand like, so this is, so we have these negative numbers here. This means that we are, um, we're not quite using what we requested, or is it that we're using over? It's using over, yeah. Okay. So it's the request minus the usage. I see. Um, uh, okay, I'm trying to. So this green lines the vert API. So this is. I don't understand. What's the so the lowest one? We have. I can see the orange one here. Is this? Yeah. So I'm assuming this is vert controller. Yes. Yeah. So we're. Okay, so our control is using quite a bit more, and then it looks like the handlers are following it up in second here. Yeah, and then it, the operator is that also in here? No, the operator is fine. And so, oh no, the operator is positive. Okay, yeah, so it's the handler, so controller, nice. and API. So, those ones are you know too underestimated the CPU requests, and these numbers like, um. I, I'm just trying to quantify, like, is this, would we consider this very small? Like, I'm just looking at this number, it looks small, but I don't know what, um, just based on what the, the metric is, like, like, is this, is this, um, like, can it's, we almost write this off? Or is this, like, something that's just uh, pretty significant? It's CPU usage, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. So, because I need, need to understand, understand the, the CPU metrics uh, in Prometheus, it, sometimes it's hard. 
So because I, I don't know if it's relative to the number of CPUs in the node. If it is, the node has 48 CPUs, so it's a very big node. Then, then maybe in a smaller machine, it might be more significant, you know, these values. But, I, but yes, it's although it looks small, you know, um, I think it's it's something that um, maybe impacts the 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 performance, you know, in somehow. Okay, so we go a little bit over. Um, okay, so we maybe need a little bit more investigation to understand the metric to see what this is. There's also um, like this doesn't go to zero. Looking at this, right? Like it does here, like, or even just these. Like per controller goes right back up to. Uh, I guess looks like underneath what it requests, and then we're. This is the one we scale down, right? This is your largest, I think 300 mm -hmm. was the number. I mean, we have zero here, right? And we're still over. Yeah, so this is, might be related to what Kevin uh, mentioned before, that uh, when we clean up the cluster, it's still, you know, have things going on and it doesn't, you know, completely goes, you know, to the, to the first stage, you know, at least, for a while, maybe maybe this is something that Kevin mentioned. He's investigating, but maybe okay. the, the you know yeah, could the interval to, to the leak, the go routine leak. Yeah, maybe. the interval between the experiments maybe must be because I think what Kevin mentioned, he will talk about that for sure. But uh, maybe it was the garbage collector, you know, working, and yeah, yeah, so. Um, we need maybe to wait more time, you know, to it, between experiments, something like that, you know. It took like five minutes for the CPU to calm down <clears throat> after a hundred VM test. And I, from what it looks like, I really think it's a garbage collector because we have a lot of like the, the JSON decoding. We've all created a lot of resource uh, objects that seem to get cleaned up during that time. Okay. Um, but it's just an assumption based on flame charts and traces. Um, so we should wait more time if we do like step-by-step -step tests. Mm -hmm. um, but what, are you, what do you see there also could be what I've seen before. Um, during one of my tests, my cluster didn't have just enough resources and it was very full. And at some point, Bird Handler did never recover it was at full CPU low trying to uh, do whatever I didn't have profiling then. Um, and it only came back down after deleted all the VMs. And I think it, it got stuck on something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this garbage collection. So to me, it just, uh, I don't know, like, does it, does it sound like to anyone that's, that's an abnormal, that's abnormal behavior. Like we shouldn't um, be spending so much CPU and memory to do this garbage collection. Like I don't know what Kubernetes has just to compare, but um, I mean, it seems like if you're doing JSON, if you're doing much work with JSON serialization or deserialization, it seems like something um, we optimize significantly. Yeah. So in in Kubernetes, we had like we had a few issues where we built something new that did a lot of decoding and garbage collection was a huge issue at some point. Um, and we had to rework that decoding to use different ways of, of, of solving the problem. But I think to some extent it's okay for us, um, but we should or could still look at like how much we decode, like if our caches need to be um, the way they are, like if you can, if you can, just not decode at some places where we don't need it or decode partial objects or something, but I don't, I think that's a lot of work and I'm not sure if it's that much a problem. Okay, well, we can talk about it more, Kevin, when, cause I think you have a section here when, and when mm -hmm. you bring up what your work is. Um, okay, so kind of the takeaway here is like, we're, we're using a little bit more CPU than we requested. Um, we need to further understand exactly um, what this means so that we could Decide what we want to do next. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's not good, Marcelo. Uh, we'll go to the next one then. Okay. Um, next is uh, a bug fix enhancement. So this is, oh, this is you, Kevin. Okay. You're next. 
All right, we can just roll over into the discussion then. Yeah, the, I think the document is is um, only the stuff I found. I took to use it as a notebook. I think everything there okay. should be taken care of now. Um, that was just the go routines. Um, but I shared a few of those those um, snapshots showing in general what's going on um, in Slack. I think. Let me see. Yeah, I saw the I saw the um, the other PRs. Um, I have them up here. So this uh, the two right here. Um, yeah, I think both are merged now. I just got an email that mine also merged. Yep. So David fixed one of them. The front, the first link, and then the second one was um, was the block yeah. that we were doing in here in this go yeah. routine, and it was just leaking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything though that you want to say? Uh, anything more you want to say about this? Um, um, just about the the resource usage, maybe a little like at the or the CPU load I saw after we we see after deletion. Um, okay. I'm like the numbers we see on Word Handler. I think like I only created I think 100 VMs and then 300. We have to see how how, how high we can get. But um, in general, it we we should look into if we can optimize it. But the numbers we reach on CPU load, I th and also memory load, still seem pretty okay. Like it it. it if you think about that, this thing is managing, let's say, a, a 300 VMs um, per node. I think that's still a fair load, to some extent. I, I mean, the people actually running it have to have to say that, but it doesn't. Um, it doesn't look like we're doing something completely wrong. Only small parts that we could optimize. Okay. Um, I don't know if well, somebody so I disagrees or agrees with that. <laughs> Let me pull up my snapshots, but I think we were still in the um, like 0, 0.0 or 0 0.1 areas of CPU load, and that is, like, I think, we can live with that. Yeah, even the high load after it's like 0 0.02 CPU uh, load, yeah. and never more than I don't know 250 megabytes of RAM, millibytes of RAM. Still sounds fair as long as we don't see problems with stuff taking too long. Okay, how should I classify this then? So, like, um, just after the deletion, we have a little bit more. Uh, we have some cleanup to do. With, um... Yeah, the garbage collector gets uh, load from deleting all the VM objects from its cache. I think. Um... We expect it, so. Yeah. Um, if it's if the, the load is too high, getting too many CPUs for too long time, then then it might be an issue. But if it's like a, just a little bit and for five minutes, if it's, I would say that yeah, so maybe it's fine. A reason I would see to fix that would be if we see the word handle not doing things fast enough because it's. The garbage collector takes too many cycles, or it's it's taking away CPU from more important stuff, which I think it shouldn't. Um, like with uh, your phase transition stuff, uh, you're investigating. If we see the vert handler is, is severely impacted at a certain scale, that might be why. We I'm pretty sure we have worse problems if that I, with that could cause that, but. Um, Without any problems it's causing, I think this is normal. Okay. And so we can, I think, I mean, it seems like the more, I mean, just kind of what we're talking about, like there's more objects, it sounds like we're going to require more CPU. So this is going to grow, like let's say if it was 10,000, <clears> we would expect this to expand even more, right? Yeah. Um, probably. Yeah. But we also okay. have limits on how many VMs one root handler can handle in the first place. Because oh, right. so there's port limits node, on so... nodes and yeah, this, yeah. Okay, so we're, if this is 300, this is fairly high. Okay, so this, I mean, this is probably like around the max. Of, oh, I don't know what it is, but it's fairly high, 300 pods. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a good way to characterize it. Okay. And it, it, in, in the, in the real world, it's also only a problem if you have, like, it, it could only be a problem if your use case requires you to have a high turnover. You create a lot of VMs and you need a lot of VMs and you will have that load of cleaning up behind you. Um, but if you just run a lot of VMs, uh, it, it won't be one. Which a lot of use cases can be like test runs and stuff, of course. So, okay. All right. There we go. Okay. I think that covers it. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're basically seeing this at like, I mean, these are 300, this is a 300 tests, and we see a non zero level. I mean, this is, I think this is, this is 200 or is this 100? 200. 200, it's, um, just a blip above zero, and then, um, then it's fairly steady all the way. And I mean, it's 100 or less. That's probably what the majority of use case is going to be in here. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, let's go to the. Actually, Kevin, are you are you all set with this? Uh, can we go to the next one? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. Um, look, we have we have a few more things that popped out of the. Um, of Marcelo's tests, I think I'll see what I look at next, or if other components also leak stuff. Okay. Um, and the Go routines, like so, we and this one's. Um, are we like in the latest after your two patches merge? Are we seeing um, no more leaks? I think after that second one, I think you did another test, right? And you didn't see many leaks. No, I, yeah, um, yeah. It's still continuing, isn't it? So. I think the fix, I think Ramon also mentioned that it's re related to migration and and I don't remember the the other thing, but um, oh, you don't see any more leaks? Yeah, this is, uh, this oh, is after the yeah. fix. Uh, this no, is um, there, there, before there's fix. before and after. This is after, yeah, fairly steady. Yeah, I mean, that can't get much better. That looks pretty Sometimes good. the word handler goes up on itself. And what I what I was looking at was that it's generally using a lot of routines because I I don't know we, we do a lot of stuff in the background we watch a lot of stuff um, node labeler runs with ten um, threads uh, stuff like that but that's that's fine I mean we're still building programs that run in threads some are to be expected. Yep. Yeah, that looks good. One forty. Yeah, I mean, like you have one, yeah, so 246, I mean, we don't go above and 147 the highest here. That looks good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. Um, all right, we'll go to the next one. So new metric to monitor request counts by resource and operation. Okay, this is David's. Yeah, <laughs> so what I did here was I add a new metric that's parsing URLs from the client uh, for all our control plane components. So when we, we do any sort of client operation, uh, this hook intercepts it, parses the URL, figures out what the resource was. So the resource being a pod, uh, virtual machine, instance, whatever. And then the operation, uh, not being the HTTP uh, verb, but being the actual Kubernetes operation, meaning a list, a watch, uh, a git, patch a put or um, an update instead of a put and things like that. Um, so what we have is we have a counter now that we can say uh, across our entire control plane, let's figure out how many um, gets we're doing on virtual machine instance objects or how many updates, for example, we're doing on virtual machine uh, instance objects. And that gives us an idea for our density tests, um, how many writes we're doing for these objects. Uh, and we can figure out which uh, exact resources we're writing to the most and things like that. And then we can create thresholds that and say, hey, we expect in this density test to call update and patch on virtual machine instances X number of times. And we go over that, then we failed our threshold. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. So I, I integrated this metric into that perf audit tool and we can create thresholds and all that good stuff for it. Nice, sweet. Um, yeah, this is a cool one. I want like this one would be a cool one to see over time. 
after, you know, if like if we had a VM running for a long period of time, I'm curious to see some of the events that it fires off. And we've had mistakes uh, occur here where some subtle code path where kind of causes an update storm or something like that with our VMIs. And that mm -hmm. puts quite a bit more load on the API server and it also impacts our um, you know, time to, to running, creation to running. So we probably see lots of things occur when issues arise, uh, when we have a, like an update storm. We'll see that the, the time is increasing uh, before we can get to running, but then we'll also see that uh, certain thresholds around uh, API calls will probably get hit as well. So that's a cue us in. Hey, we're making a lot more updates now. That doesn't make sense. Let's figure out why. Yep. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we're getting a lot of valuable information out of this. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on this? Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty good. So I would say this is nice. And I just comment did some few comments. Um, it's, it's just not not mean that the comments, maybe uh, it's important, but it's just something to discuss. So first thing is uh, operation. So it's, uh, I would say like the other metrics, I would say the other metrics related to that, I don't know if it's super related, but the, in the same section, they actually call verbs and they, they also has like this list watch. And I don't know, maybe we should keep also verbs. So it's like the domicature that's being used. And uh, I don't know if, if it has update, but I, I think it has, it's, it's still used like um, maybe put and the HTTP, you know, uh, nomenclature. Yeah, so verb is referring to the HTTP, um, uh, I don't even know what the call, I guess operation or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's referring to the HTTP spec itself. So we're gonna get puts, uh, patches, gets, uh, deletes, creates, things like that. Or I'm uh, sorry, not deletes and creates. You get a delete, but instead of a create, you'd have a put and things like that. So the reason that shows operation, we can pick a different term or whatever. I didn't want to confuse what uh, we were getting here. So we're not getting the HTTP, uh, whatever operation, we're getting the Kubernetes like action. Maybe I could call it action. I, I don't know. I, I didn't want there it's to the be- It's the event, right? It's, it's the type of Kubernetes client action that is taking place or operation that's taking place, which isn't necessarily directly correlated with HTTP call. I think we call them verbs in Kubernetes. We do? Okay. I'm fine with calling I, them I, verb. I, I, no, it, verbs also has watch and list and you yeah. know, this kind of yeah. operation. So that, that, see, that's... So when we look at the request uh, client, oh, sorry, rest client request latency seconds. I think that one has a verb in it as well. It's not reporting the HTTP, I'm sorry, it's reporting the HTTP verb, not the Kubernetes verb. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with uh, these terms meaning different things for what look like similar, um, similar client type behavior or monitoring? Yeah, not, not sure. So I just, I just saw that. So, and brought it to discussion. So, um. yeah, I'm just, is it like, so this is the, the verb that we talked, so we're the Kubernetes verb that we're talking about, like, this is um, like when Kubernetes, when you create something where we have a create event in Kubernetes, this is like that request being caught. Right. Or not, it doesn't call it a create, we call it, we're calling it like a post or something. Is that no, I mean, be... that's the confusion here. So, um, so you would get a create and not a post, right? In my metric, you would get a create. You would get exactly okay. what the Kubernetes client is doing, uh, which is okay. called a create. So yeah, you mentioned make sure, make sure it's not the HTTP. Is it on other protocol? But I, I saw that you were parsing the, the URLs and it actually has like this verbs um, names in it. But sometimes 
Did, wait, I mean, would these be classified as events? I mean, is that what this is? This, there's... I wouldn't call it an event because an event is something specific uh, in Kubernetes. But this is an event entire, type? Uh, the event is actually an object. Uh, in in HTTP, it's called method, and I think in Kubernetes, we call it verb. Okay, I'm, I'm going to call it verb, and <laughs> maybe we should um, uh, re The HTTP part is called method. Right. Yeah, and that's exactly what it, it is, the technical term is for it. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. Um, I, was, I couldn't find it in my head either. I was like, what was it called? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Method. It's just confusing because now we have uh, another metric that's using verb that is not, re yeah. it's referring to the HTTP method, not the Kubernetes verb. All right, I'm glad we have terminology now. But... Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so verb will be all those uh, create. Yeah, my last comment about that was, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, right, go on. I was just like all the verbs like create lists get um our verbs here it, that's all I want to say go ahead yeah yeah my last comment is just to try so it's not very clear to me uh, the the whole difference about the red I know that it's getting different information but it, especially because you mentioned that the rest client request it's for ATP in your metric it's getting something else so is it uh what is this something else so which which other protocol are you getting here that is not atp so it might might be nice to describe the difference um just to be clear about the the, the metric the difference between what for example the rest client requests latest okay. seconds yeah yeah and, we're getting uh, the uh the resource and then the Kubernetes uh, verb. That's that's the difference. Risk client request latency seconds is just getting the um, the HTTP method and then a, um, a kind of normalized URL, which is has the resource in it, kind of. But you can't do things like, say, how many lists that I get on that resource or how many watches and things like that, because those are um, they're all gets. So a, a list watch and a get, um, as far as like the Kubernetes verbs, all are the HTTP method get all three of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is it, you're saying that like, is this why you chose to use the Kubernetes verb as opposed to the, the method for HTTP method? Yes. So we can get more information. They mean okay. different things, right? Yep. Also, latency okay. seconds is not reporting uh, watches because it's a long-standing, like long pole HTTP. So we don't have any visibility into, for example, um, <clears throat> if if we were seeing lots of watches occur during during our stress test, and that would mean that informers or something are failing a lot, and we're getting a lot of errors we would have visibility into that, at least on that I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with the Kubernetes client that it doesn't give us that information on the request somehow through context or, I like, guess you have to do uh, regex. Uh, I expected more from them, <laughs> but uh, I think I think I like how the metric, what the metric gives us now. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, the, the last thing is I was thinking is, so if those metrics, both are both of them, you know, are getting all the calls and they are reporting, I know, different granularity of information. However, maybe, you know, with this new metric, we don't even need need to care about this other one, isn't it? If you collect the, the latency, um, right now you are only counting. Does it make sense if you get the latency of the request and then you have we have a whole complete new metric and we don't really need this one anymore. I'm not sure. One of the tricky things here is this rest client request latency seconds is not a Kubert specific metric. It's the extension of a Kubernetes uh, metric that other oh, components that's right. expose. 
So if we wanted to kind of seamlessly work with existing dashboards and things like that. Yeah, but I think, for example, for the Kubernetes, I it has prefix, isn't it? I think it's, I don't remember now, but it might be it has Kubelet REST client request, you know, it still changed the name. So it, it's not like a, I think they just have a label that helps. They have a component them. label. Yeah. Oh, okay. So or the name like remains that. the same. Okay. Yeah. And we're actually using a Kubernetes library to do this. Like it's kind of like a wrapper. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's the same thing that they're using internally. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to discuss that. Yeah. I, I think it sounds reasonable. Yeah. We do have a lot of metrics and that's something that is concerning to me about the potential mm -hmm. load caused by all this. Uh, and I don't have great answers for that because I don't have a lot of experience with what's too much collection. And if we are, um, if we need to be tighter or more restrictive about creating new metrics or even reevaluating the metrics that we have today to make sure that they are all valuable. I think that there's some things specifically around the, um, what we collect about every individual VMI um, that might be pretty intensive as well. Probably the most intensive, but I don't mm -hmm. know. Something, maybe, should we be tracking? Is there a way to, um, if we wanted to understand this better, the Prometheus load and whether we're bumping up into any sort of, what would be the, even the limits? Are we talking about bandwidth limits or are we talking about uh, just the, the database stream of keeping all these time series or uh, where would I it think, start to fall apart? I think all, all of this. Okay. Yeah, um, maybe maybe it's not just the bandwidth but you know when prometheus is scrapping you know the service and then the service needs to uh, you know bring up all these metrics and if it's too much maybe it's using too much memory for that you know cpu to compute that so this might be a problem in the service itself and also Prometheus, so if it gets too large, so Prometheus also, it's known to break, you know, at scale because of the size of the, you know, metrics. Yeah. So where do you, where do you think we might hit this, uh, this issue? Um, because I, like, even, um, you know, what we're doing now, at least the stuff and the stuff I'm aware of, it, I don't think we're really causing too much, um, usage from Prometheus. I mean, is this, is, do you think this one would be, or is it like you're just talking in general? This I is think a drop this... in the bucket, I would say, compared to everything that we have. Yeah, this should be yeah, fine. Yeah. It's I mean, the, all the, the metrics. Ones, like, we're yeah, we're like, one. we might run into troubles if like, if you do like per BMI, like say, for example, we were to track every single BMI's um, I don't get gather data from every single VMI or something like that. Um, you can run into some trouble there, uh, like at, at scale. I can. We do. Yeah. We do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, but but like per like, um, like, and, and I guess it depends on like in some ways the events that you do. Like, which which ones, for example, are or like we gather information on like an individual VMI basis. Like we report like information, like our, the metric we're scraping, like the, the, the tag is the BMI name. Like the, the, in other words, the amount of data we're exporting is, is crazy high. There's a lot of information that we expose in BERT Handler that aggregates uh, metrics for every BMI on the local node. And that's how it's exposed. I'm curious. If we're doing it per VMI, or if yeah, it's, let's see. Per, per 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 resource tags on or labels on metrics can be a problem. So far, the only load issues with Prometheus I saw were really um, storage related. Like if you create too many labels like that, at some point you can't store a week of history, but three days. Um, and at some point, that Prometheus just 
takes a while scraping and runs into timeouts. If the uh, metrics endpoint gets like, too big a file, but that really only happens if you um, yeah. I mean, I, find the amount like of I, labels to your resources. Like ultimately, I'm not like it, like you could disable like you don't have to scrape all of them, and we can always like if it's like it's not like we're totally going to be just um, like cornering anyone. Like you, if if it's something that we're like we're doing too much, but I mean, even this like. I'm just talking about the ones that we've worked on here. I, I don't think are don't see like especially like the transition times that David did. Like those were um, like the number of tags that we export is not many. Like it's for like five. It's a constant amount. And we just kind of have an average of times for every time we report instead of like an individual VMI's runtime or timestamp per um, uh, per transition. That would be a lot. Yeah, like but on. As a rule of thumb, I think you can say if you create a metric and uh, the amount of labels and different labels is um, a fixed number, you're fine. And I think with this, yeah. we are there. It's not it's not growing with um, the amount of labels and label variations, but growing with the amount of objects we have. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 exactly like when you run into trouble. It's like when it's 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 when the it's when the it's dependent on the number of objects you create, and that's when uh, or like the number of tags you have is dependent on the number of objects you create, and then it can become overwhelming. So, yeah, if that's that's it's fine. And then and then again, like you can always you know people can always disable them if it's something that it's just very granular. We're definitely doing that with VMI. So uh, we have the VMI name is a label. For some of these metrics uh, and their gauges. There's lots and lots of Prometheus gauges. In okay. in Virg Handler or for those you just submitted? Oh, no, no, in Virg Handler. Not in the okay. Yeah, okay. I just want to make okay. sure I, I was saying that we do some bad, I don't know, bad is the right word. We're doing some things that have uh, potentially performance implications. I don't think the yeah. thing I just introduced does because the, the labels are pretty um set we're not going to get a lot of new it's not an infinite <laughs> number they get created but uh i mean VMIs, with the uh, yeah with the dashboards and the prometheus in our test environments we have and get um each role also provide us metrics about prometheus itself and we can also have a look at those and see how how much we kill prometheus with some changes and measure our impact yeah. that way as well. Yeah, this is, so this is something we can, I guess we'll kind of take away from this. It's something we keep in mind when we generate metrics, if we're reviewing things, like we're creating new metrics, if we yeah. are having things that are dynamically, or I guess well, the number of labels or tags scale with the number of objects created, then we just need to be aware of that. And maybe we should, you know, it, it might be okay to have it in some cases, but we also want to make sure that if we're introducing this metric that we also have one maybe that can provide similar information, but sort of like a, a summary instead of the more granular option so that we can still provide some value in case someone wants to disable it uh, because of just well, you know, scale or something. I think maybe it might be a good idea to come up with a plan to analyze that. You see? So every time that we do a scale test, I don't, I don't know how, so we need to think about it. <laughs> yeah. We we could just verify, you know, if we are getting too bad on that or not. So, you know, and, you know, people can still keep like introducing metrics. And if we have a way to evaluate that, we, we can rise on, you know, on our <laughs> Sorry. Sorry that. That. I, I keep messing up, Ryan. Uh, here, I'll give you a bullet point now. Yeah, so what you're talking about, Marcelo, is essentially uh, monitoring our monitoring, uh, which is, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> We're monitoring <laughs> the load that our monitoring uh, puts on the uh, cluster. It's all it's all load, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't matter where it's coming from. Uh, Maybe Prometheus has some information about that, you know, and then we can we can collect this. 
This might be a good one. I think, you know, like if we have, I, I think at some point we kind of come up with some guidance in terms of like how to run Qvert at scale, this would be a good one. Say like, okay, we have these metrics here, you know, maybe they're important. Like maybe we have, a, there's a legitimate reason for them um, at smaller scale, but at larger scale, like if you want to be, if you're talking thousand plus notes, you probably want to disable these because um, they can affect your scale mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, I just come up with like Prometheus has this target and it's at least says how long it's taking to scrape, you know, metrics. And we, we can have a maybe a look on that. So if the target's getting too high to scrape metrics, it's something can can become a problem for latency. And also we can check like a, how how much you know is the Prometheus database it's increasing, you know, in a, in the test. So and ultimately I guess what we care about here is the response time when we query. Yes, is it not? And so we want to know, uh, isn't that where it would fall apart? I'm, I'm mm. making stuff up, but my expectation would be if I made a query to Prometheus to get some metrics, that if it was having to do a lot of calculations that really intensive across the database, that it would be in the request latency of giving me back my results. Yeah, this is one point. Another point, it's what I mentioned. I'm not sure if it will happen. But if, if for example, if Vita Handler is generating too much metrics, you know, just the process to generate the metrics and keep the metrics on memory, it's an overhead, you know. For our and process, you're saying, you're saying yes, for our company, yeah. Exactly, it. yeah. Because if it, the problem is only Prometheus, it can, you know, Think in a cluster that has dedicate many, you know, you know, dedicate nodes for Prometheus itself, um, and doesn't collocate that. But if it's actually introducing problem in the service that are running, you know, yeah, this might yeah. become a problem. So I, I think like I have two notes here. I think this kind of captures it. We're gonna let, let's we'll, well first of all let's just keep this in mind when we're. Cause like, it's true. Like right, this, the central, like a lot of the, the central piece of what we're dealing with their what they're measuring is it's around Prometheus right now. So we need to be very conscious of what we're doing. So that's true. We need to be, we need to monitor our load. So um, let's just, whenever we see a situation where we we're adding metrics and the number of objects are created scales or the number of tags labels scale, the number of objects, we just need to be aware of it. But um, I think the real way we kind of communicate this is when we talk about like having um, a general guide of how to scale with Qbert. I think that's where we capture this as a thing that that, that best practice or something people need to watch out for. Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's at least the best thing we can do mm -hmm. just to make sure that users aren't affected and then and something we just be aware of with our code review. Okay. All right, that was a good discussion. All right, uh, we have a few more points. We don't have a ton of time, so let's go to the next one. Um, David, I think this is yours. This is per scale load generator. I oh, know this is Marcel. No, Marcel. Yeah, it looks yeah. great. Uh, Oops. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, well, it's regarding like the the framework that we have been discussing for a while, and uh, David created the you know the profiler no not the profiler but the report generator the audit tool to scrape metrics and generate the report and and now it's uh you know a proposal to generate to generate the load and for different tasks so we have the density test but we can add the, the idea is to add more tests later for example you know this um stress test that has constant load and ramp up, you know, and keep uh, creating the life cycle of the VM. So creating, deleting in the system. And and actually those are the tests that we can see this, the steady state, you know, um, of the um, the system and, and see how, how much pressure it can support. Anyway, so um, 
And then uh, I think I saw that uh, Kevin and you guys um, makes uh, made some comments, so I will go through that and see. Cool. Awesome. I, I have one kind of general comment about this, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's something that needs to be done immediately. But uh, in the future, when we think about expanding this tool, and I haven't looked at this in great detail either, but the one thing that I noticed is that it looks like uh, it's creating um, it's got an internal way of structuring the VMIs and the things that we have control over are primarily the image and things like that. Um, so that, that comes in as an, an argument to this. In the future, um, maybe we should look at a templating mechanism, something as simple as take an existing VMI and uh, know how to use that as the base for our load and just create lots and lots of VMIs with maybe different names uh, for the same thing. Um, because we are probably going to want to begin load testing in different ways, like using different types of storage or uh, different um, types of um, CPU and memory and maybe even topologies with that, uh, like dedicated versus uh, non-dedicated. I, I don't know what all is going to transpire in the future. But that would give us the flexibility if we had a template uh, in the future. Right. This, this is a good idea. So it's like I, I tried to to start it as simple as possible because um, you know the, the, the less <laughs> the less experience to a big uh, PR, it's 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 hard to, to go in, you know, yep. move forward. However, um, yeah, this is this, I think this is a good idea. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can Already change the you know template. You know, I mean template has like a, the VMI YAML, isn't it? In the template folder, and then actually we use that and just change the name of the of this, isn't it? So then we can point which template to use. Is is that uh, what my, you mean? that was also my first thought that if if like I, I commented that right now it's VMI, but don't we maybe also want to test VMs to test the, the controller part, load test that part as well? And yeah. I'm honestly surprised. I, I, I look for a bit. I was so sure there is something already providing that for Kubernetes. Like you provide a folder of YAML templates and it does exactly what this is doing specifically for VMIs. It just creates some X times and deletes some X times and does it over and over. I was sure there was a load a simple load testing tool for Kubernetes like that. But I couldn't find it on first try. A uh, Qburner does that, but it, it does a lot more as well, and um, it doesn't have some of the tight integration with VMIs and VMs that we might want in the future. I mean, I've had decent results using Qburner just with a, a VM or a, excuse me, a VMI as a template, and then it creating a bunch of them and deleting a bunch of them. But when we look at creating uh, lots of VMs specifically. Uh, we'll probably want to begin doing actions on those VMs, like um, create a bunch of VM objects, start them all, then restart them all, like things that are VM specific uh, would be difficult. And then we're going to probably look at migrations at some point in the future as well, uh, mm -hmm. being part of the density. So I think as much as I don't like writing our own code unless we really have to. Uh, I don't dislike the idea of creating our own tool to generate yeah. code that's VM specific. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I remembered something like, I don't know, with a, a Terraform or Ansible style <laughs> language where you like define test plans and, and a load test. But like, yeah, I might have made that up. So Marcel, <laughs> one of the things that uh, might not be terribly difficult to do uh, initially would be what would you think about changing all of these CLI options to an input config uh, instead? So we could pass in input config that we can expand in the future and make that repeatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually like this, you know, um, I was thinking to do that, you know, in the beginning, but then, yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's good, and also I, I maybe I can do something as you guys also mentioned, instead of call VMIs, 
uh, have the YAML with the template and actually call an object and can be whatever the template is. And then it's just create me the as many objects that we want. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that the input config would be the thing that's going to serve us great in the future because uh, I can see this game really complex uh, trying to make a CLI, um, a repeatable mm -hmm. CLI command out of this. Um, as far as the template thing goes, that's something we can follow up. Like, I want you to make progress on this and be able to get it in uh, fairly quickly. So, whatever you think is the minimum um, that's usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will work on that tomorrow. Oh, with a config, you mean like having all those parameters, I don't know, as a, as a YAML file, and we can have a folder of different load tests that even CI could run? Yeah, so a YAML file meaning, yeah, a YAML file is input, and then I'm thinking like with our periodic or whatever we have in yeah. CI, then you just have a repeatable config that you run through here. And I want us to remain flexible with this stuff too. Like, um, if we find that the structure, like, I don't want us to treat this as a, like a version to API immediately. <laughs> yeah. Let's be flexible. And if we figured out that we want to restructure things in the future, um, not try to figure out how to make things backwards compatible, or whatever, there's this just tools to help us. So there's some, yeah. In here. Sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks, Marcelo. Um, yeah. The, oh, the other thing I, I brought the, eventually like you have a um, person here like we can we eventually can get to extending it to this stuff um as well which would be cool because i was kind of mm -hmm. like you have in here like we could also get to more config and that's what kevin was saying like if we could drop in a test file config or something and we can do other types and then um and do get uh, all sorts of different tests and different results mm -hmm. cool okay um next up is the Kubernetes client rate limiter config, uh, make it configurable. I don't think Roman's here. This was a discussion I was having with Roman. Yeah, it got merged. Or at least I, oh wait, it might have not got merged. I approved it, but I think it might still be. Yeah, this was just to summarize. Like I was just looking at this and I need to wait for him. But all, the only thing I was talking about with this was one of the tests is like, it's creating, um, it's, it's creating VMIs and measuring their like their performance and then increasing the QPS and then well, getting a baseline, increasing the QPS and then, and then doing it again and measuring a difference. Um, yeah, and my, my take on this was that this, this is just a little complex because there's just a lot that can happen when we're trying to measure performance here and this test and I'm kind of hoping that we do it entirely outside in the in the tool so that we can just kind of um, yeah, like just so that we don't, um, my, my fear is like, we don't, we don't, we, we do it like very deliberately instead of kind of, uh, just in this, um, this one functional test, I, I think like it doesn't always necessarily get the best results just by doing this because like what we're after is we're after like making sure that we're not getting rate limited, not necessarily the performance because QPS could change in the future and all of a sudden this just breaks on us. Well, so, but this specific test is meant to target whether the client's rate limiter uh, configuration got picked up. That's really all it's doing. We just want some sort of indication that when we set values, that some performance noticeably changes. It's all about the rate limiter configuration being propagated. That's all we care about. Yeah. Well, but that's what I'm. That's kind of my point. Is is like. Can we, is there a better way to test that specifically? Like, do we, can we do it without change, like testing performance? Uh, well, that's the end result. Like, if you want to know if it did something, that's the only way of really testing it as an end user. Uh, the thing that Roman's doing here that gives me confidence that this will remain at least somewhat viable is he's using percentages. So he's running a some sort of um, scenario with one configuration for the limiter, and then he's making a pretty drastic change to that configuration, posting it, and running the same scenario, and just measuring the percentage of change. Uh, and he expects a certain percentage of change. 
So it's mm -hmm. relative to the actual machine and test scenario that's running at that exact moment. Yeah, right. so I mean, the, the test is flaky. So that's yeah. why we, we start to talk a little bit about that. I did some suggestion about that. So if you can, if you go to the last comment, is actually related to what you know Ryan is saying is so instead of we just check like uh, how much lower it gets for example the, what's flaky here it's actually Roman wrote like uh, it should be five times is lower but actually was uh, three times lower only, you know, something like that. I don't, don't, don't remember exactly what was, was here, but it's something like that. So then instead of making like a true relative, you know, and maybe hard to, to verify that, we can maybe count how many times the request got like a throat slit, you know? Uh, because what I mean, so in the REST client, it has like just long throttle latency and extra long throttle latency. And when it reads those things, uh, it's right in the log. So we could maybe just, you know, when we make it like, a, you know, the curve per second too low, we might see more just uh, things on the log. And then we can see that it's getting, you know, throttle the, the request. If we increase the throughput, we expect to actually maybe don't see any of this uh, thing on the log. And then, you know, it's just a way to count that uh, if it's doing better or, or worse. And we don't need to play with relative, you know, uh, performance, uh, you know, like five, three times or things like that that make it very tricky to and the test sits flake for that because of that. Makes sense. Yeah. If we had like, yeah, if we have a way to measure latency, I think that just cuts a little bit better than, yeah, than the performance. So. Or, yeah. If, if we don't go to the log, we can just use this, you know, yeah. actually this thresholds that the, the client goal has. So, and then just use that. And, Okay, well, well, something we can discuss with Roman when he's back. Okay, uh, we are almost out of time here. Um, so we can cover the last two probably hopefully pretty quickly. Um, uh, I have the next one's the, the, the QVert performance threshold. So um, I wrote this originally and then I just wired it up to the, um, the audit um, tool that David wrote. Uh, basically, the only the, the thing I wanna say about this is that, so I took Marcelli, I took your density test um, I kind of split it up a little bit into a few different things. Um, uh, well, a uh, well, few like additions. One of them is like that that we um, we make we take a look at the Prometheus. Um, the we reach out to Prometheus. We run the audit tool to after we uh, we run the test, and then um, I took your test and I took like some of your common functions and I split them out. So that we can do things like things that are for the framework, um, just common functions in here, and then things that are like for the VMI we can do in here. And and kind of you were saying earlier how like when we can generate um, VMIs from a template, that would kind of be that would be cool here actually. That was thinking that would make these tests even easier to write. But the uh, we're gonna go back to your density test. So once I have it hooked up, um, where's your density test right here? Um, yeah, I mean, this just will run the same and then we just get the information uh, at the end by just running the, the personal audit tool and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still testing this. I have the, I'm just um, fighting with bank cluster up now to uh, to make sure everything is looking correctly. But I did, this is just the work in progress post that I have right now. How are you getting the time frames for this? Are you doing like a get time? Yeah, so I have a, um, yeah, I do like right before each, I do a, I get a time and then at the end, I do another get a time, get time again. Oh yeah, and you had 30 seconds, all right, cool. Yeah, I think yeah. 30 seconds <laughs> is the default scrape period. Um, it does help. Yeah, so yeah, then, then that'll get us our, um, um, 
our metrics and make them available and then we can see i there's like so much i could see we could do with this like i mean i could see us getting if we could have the take a grafana snapshot or something like and then have it available that'd be so cool too um, but yeah i mean this will get us something that wires it together so that when we can very quickly create more of this or of these mm -hmm. marcelo in the future do you see your performance uh tool the the stress that yeah yeah you do okay. yes all right so i actually did also comment about that so this this was like something you know to restart and uh we are writing as functional tests and you know performance test is not is no functional test so we should maybe make it clear that it's different so it will yeah, be so better to use the tool so so what you asked, what you're saying is like we we basically will replace this with the tool. Like we basically yeah. make a call out, we wire this up to the tool or something. Or would we not? Like, I mean, is that what would be kind of um like is our density test would it be triggered by something like, you know, in here, like we do like um or would we run it um it maybe can be even somewhere else. So yeah. Well, I guess I mean I guess it doesn't really well, we could talk about it when we get there, but I, I guess like what the um we want this eventually to be run in CI. So your your load, I mean, this is basically your load test, right? And this is our um, gather information, our audit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, that this we would basically, just kind of the way it is now, we would just call out to the tool right here, place this entirely with your tool. And then, um, yeah, and then we have, um, and then we do our audit at the end. So it looks something like that. Okay. Okay. We yes. plenty of coordinate on these on these uh, MRs. Then I might just wait for years to go in and I can uh, fin uh, decide what to do. Probably just pull all this out and then we'll, or maybe I'll just wire it right up to what you do. Mm -hmm. Something like no, that. yeah. The, the idea is to have something like that, and but then later is to replace the tools that uh, we are developing. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're a little bit over. Uh, the last one. Um, Evaluation. So I'm as a speaking Marcelo. And I don't think I have access to the doc. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So I might might have created with my Red Hat account. Sorry, I would <laughs> I will fix that. Um, Do we want to? Is this going to take a little bit? Should we save this for next time? Yeah, maybe. I think it's better. Yeah. Okay. So then I fix right. that because we are we are red light past. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a. Let me just move it over for next time. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say twelve or something. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll hold on to this. I'll I'll copy it up for for the next time. Okay. All right. We're at time, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.